All right, without wasting time, we'll go into the uh, distinguished lecture. And uh, to deliver that lecture is uh, someone, a very distinguished personality, not just in Nsoka, not just in the Southeast, uh, and not just in Nigeria, but globally. Ositobu is an economist, academic, and a public policy expert from Enugu State of Nigeria. He has held various prominent roles in the Nigerian government and academic circles. Notably, he served as the chief economic advisor to the president of Nigeria and was also the director general of the National Planning Commission. Obu has a deep background in development economics and with a focus on issues related to poverty alleviation, economic development, and governance. He's also a professor at the University of Nigeria in Soka, where he teaches economics and continues to contribute to discussions on Nigeria's economic policies and development strategies. He is highly regarded for his contributions to national planning and his intellectual work in advancing economic reforms in Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, without wasting time, let's welcome uh, for a citation of Osi Tobu, Venerable Professor Collins Ubu. The Chairman of the Occasion, Spiritual Fathers of the Day, and the Royal Father of the Day. Professor Osita Ubu, OON, is an icon, an economist. As a result, the citation of him will be very, very economical. I am talking about a man whose name is not even flowery, yet with massive meaning and significance, Osita. He's a man of many parts and beautiful and exciting colors but not with a coat of many colors, like the biblical Joseph. A man whose story personality can be better described as a colossus. By the way, for your information, is a native of Ufuku, in the South, local government area. He wouldn't want his citation to be like the religious litany. It's a brisk one. And so, before he became a professor, 45 years ago, he graduated from the Department of Economics, University of Nigeria, Soka. I said 45 years ago. Before he proceeded to Howard University in Washington, D.C., where he obtained an MA in economics in 1984 and a PhD in economics in 1988. He also earned a certificate in corporate governance from Harvard University in 2009. He was a visiting fellowship stroke scholar at the Brooklyn Institution in Washington, D.C. in 2012. He serves on the faculty of the African Development Institute of the African Development Bank. He was a consultant research economist in the African region of the World Bank in Washington, D.C. between 1987 and 1991. He worked for the International Development Research Center of Canada in Ottawa and at the regional office in Nairobi as a program office Stroke Senior Program Specialist from 1991 to 2001. Over a decade, he was the Executive Director Stroke CEO of the African Technology Policy Studies Network, an international policy research and advocacy institution based in Nairobi from 2001 to 2005. 
He was a former chairman of the governing council of the Nigerian Institute of Social and Economic Research, Ebado. He was the chief economic advisor to the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the facto minister of national planning under President Olusegu Obasanjo. Can we put our hands together for him? <laughs> Professor Osita has served and still serves as on many boards to governing councils, including the Main Street Bank, African Population and Health Research Center, Kenya, our Free Heritage Institution, Anchor Insurance, the Clement Insung Foundation, and Free Vest Limited, and the Enugu State University of Science and Technology, and Veritas University, Abuja, is currently the co-chair of the Economic Advisory Council of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. On September 29, 2014, it was invested with the prestigious uh, Nigerian National Honors Office of the Order of the Niger, OON. Professor Osita has published and edited several books as well as scholarly papers on a wide range of Africa's development challenges. His latest book, Development as Attitude, was published in December 2023. He is a novelist, the author of the novel The Moon Also Sets currently used as a literature text for A-level examination in Uganda. He has lived in a number of countries, including Nigeria, United States, Canada, and Kenya, and has traveled to over 46 countries, mostly for professional engagements. Osita is currently a professor of economics, and until recently, the director of the Institute for Development Studies 2011 to 2021 at the University of Nigeria, Enugu Campus. Professor Holtz, Professor Sita holds the traditional title of Ushimiri One of Nsuka and Okosisi One of Enugu State. Mr. Chairman, my Lord Bishops, members of the High Table, clergymen, traditional rulers, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure at this juncture to welcome to the podium the lecturer on this August occasion of the unfailing of Adada Educational Summit, an economist, a philanthropist, accomplished academic, outstanding Igbo man, a novelist, and a bureaucrat, Professor Osita Ubu Oshimiri Wan of Nsoka and Okosisi Wan of Enugu State. We are here. Talk to us. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. MC Reverend, for that uh, generous introduction. I said I should stand on the existing protocol. But supposing the protocol was not well established, the IMS. When they say stand on the existing, it's assumed that uh, the protocol was well established. But I think it was. But nonetheless, I will recognize nine bishops, the bishops, Igwe uh, Ogadagidi, my good friend, Ndi Igwe, Reverend Fathers, Professors, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. And my dear general, um, a few disclaimers before I get to the le lecture. The title, the, the brochure, and we get any resemblance to what I'm going to say. You don't invite me to speak and force me to speak what you want me to speak. If you ask me to speak, here is your bandwidth, your room, so that I can play around with what I think is important. So, here is no disclaimer. Chief Onu invited me, and I thank him for the uh, invitation. Anyone get any idea what I'm going to say? And you should not hold him responsible for what I say. 
whatever I am going to say here rests with me and I'm responsible for it. I was whispering to Nani Bishop that I was also expecting to address a much wider audience beyond the Nibai. And I, I know there are people who are here who are not our people. But nonetheless, I've accepted that whatever I'm going to say, the credit will go to the foundation that provided the platform. Because when we speak, we address much larger issues. And if you listen very carefully, here are one of the tangential to the issues uh, at stake. Let me start with a few preamble. Service is not something you study. It is something you practice. Otherwise, it becomes a curricular subject and does not lead to action. Values should be experienced, not studied. The university is a non-profit enterprise with the goal of intellectual production. Business looks for a profitable product. This apparent inconsistency between academics and work can be overcome on the basis of student work study experiences in various enterprises. This is from a scholar called Cabal Alfonso. If you paid attention to this preamble, you will begin to get a sense of where this lecture is heading. Those who have listened to me before know that I tell stories. Incidentally, I'm a novelist, so I'm a storyteller. On May 18, 1955, the Right Honorable Dr. Namde Azikiwe, in seconding a motion by the Minister of Education for a bill entitled A Law to Establish the University of Nigeria in the Eastern Region of Nigeria and to provide for the governance thereof and for matters incidental thereto, be read a second time, said the following on the philosophy of education quoting the report of the African Education Commission, thus, and I quote, that all concerned distinguish clearly the educational needs, namely the education of the masses of the people, the training of teachers and leaders for the masses, and the preparation of professional men who must pass the conventional requirements of British universities that the education of the masses and their teachers be determined by the following elements, namely health, ability to develop the resources of the country, household arts, sound recreation, rudiments of knowledge, character development, and community responsibility. The native teachers should also have access to the great truths of physical and social science, and the inspiration of history and literature. This was what that commission's report said, and then Namdi Azikiwe was quoting it in 1955, seconding a motion for establishing this great university. Zeke himself then said, I make the above admission because after 35 years, the observation and recommendation of the commission are still timely. Indeed, I can say that this report forms a basis of philosophy of free education for Africa. Not because Africans deserve a separate philosophy, but in the words of Dr. Anson Phelps Dukes, the purpose of the commission was to help Africans by encouraging an education adapted to their actual needs. The time has passed when the old thesis can be successfully maintained that a curriculum well suited to the needs of a group on a given scale of civilization in one country is necessarily the best for other groups on a different level of advancement in another country or section. And I might add, at a different context 
and other competing philosophies. You know that the crisis we are facing in this country today is almost a crisis of cut and paste. Somebody flies in from Washington and tells you that if you remove subsidy, if you float your Naira, your economy will start booming. I was interviewed by channels the other day and I said, the market has to exist before you apply market forces. So where is the market for exchange rate that you are asking market forces to determine the price of Naira? Who said that subsidy is a bad word? If you come back to education, context is important. Because if you have knowledge and you lack understanding, that knowledge has no purpose. So what is the philosophy underpinning the choices that our universities make in our curriculum development, teaching and learning, and in preparing her graduates for the world of today and tomorrow? And how might the Adult Educational Foundation instigate this? In other words, what is the theory of choice? What is the human capacity gap that will be filled and how appropriate would they be under the current circumstances of Nigeria and other, other people in particular? How can we produce service and entrepreneurial oriented graduates given the current circumstances of our nation? Answers to these questions may emerge as this lecture progresses. I'm trying to lay the foundation and that is why I am using the man who basically created this university and the mission and vision he had. Zeke goes on to say, I feel that it is of utmost importance that we should inculcate in our university students not only the dignity of labor, but also the idea that by hard work, sacrifice, and self-determination, a poor student can obtain university education, essentially tying with what the foundation is trying to do, but in a different way. In many colleges and universities of the world today, Thousands of students are demonstrating that lack of funds is not an insurmountable barrier to higher education. The fact that students are not affluent enough to pay all their bills need not to make them ashamed. He then said, it is my earnest hope that indigent male and female students of the new university, meaning this university, will be encouraged to work in order to be able to meet their university expenses. It is my fondest wish that when the University of Nigeria ultimately becomes a reality, our young men and women will find opportunities for gaining experiences in life's battle so that lack of money will not deter them from obtaining higher vocational education in any of the faculties or institutes of the university. In 1955, Zeke was saying this. I hope that the training in self-help and the experience in self-reliance will make them more confident of themselves and enable them to puncture the meat of the proverbial lack of initiative and drive on the part of the Nigerian worker. All of this said while seconding a motion for the establishment of this university. He had seen tomorrow. As we stand here today, Roban shop is being opened along the University Road. I was there at the senior staff club when Mr. Anwato, the owner of Roban, came to inform the senior staff uh, members. And someone was saying Anwato needs to be invited to give a lecture on entrepreneurship. I missed an opportunity, but now I have that opportunity. What I wanted to tell Mr. Nwatu is that if you're making bread, making meat pie, making any food stuff, your shop should be linked to the food and nutrition department of the University of Nigeria. That's what Zeke wanted us to do. Your shop should become an avenue for our students to practice, to earn a living while they are studying. That's what Zeke was saying. 
as we will see later, entrepreneurship is not a thought discipline. It is a practiced vocation. Zeke of Africa saw the future, anticipated the requirements that the future of that future, and knew that the restoration of dignity of Nigerians, Indian Nugu, and other people were beyond the classroom instructions in the traditional sense. Please note that at no point did Zeke speak of giving free money to indigenous students. Rather, his emphasis was on the nobility of work, work while in school, the immeasurable value of acquiring skills while in school. This goes beyond the current fad of teaching entrepreneurial skills to students, as important as that may be. I started with history because it is in the richness of history that wisdom is derived. I did not also want to fall foul of the teachings of my great teacher, the late distinguished professor S. Kotoyo, who deemed any analytical work without a historical foundation as ahistorical, weak, and lacking in solid conceptual foundation. But more importantly, since history is about learning about the progress and decline of society, there's an implied duality in any human endeavor. History is plural, according to the scholar F.J. Taggart, allowing us to evaluate every event with respect to the advancement it brought to individuals or society and the decline that same event may have brought. We tend to forget that every reality creates other new realities, some good and others bad. Let's look at the university as Zeke was anticipating as an arbiter of change and economic progress. If I ask this audience what Nsuka would have been without the University of Nigeria, the answer will be, without a doubt, that Nsuka will be a poor, deserted place. And even I, in my ordinary liness, would have said so. However, today, I am wearing my intellectual cap, an inquisitive and interrogative cap. Truly, there is no empirical validity to the barrenness of Onsuka without the University of Nigeria viewpoint, because we have not studied nor analyzed the counterfactual. What will it have been without? Who said so? Does it not occur to us that advancements the institution may have brought may also have been accompanied by the immediate society's reduced hunger for risk-taking in jeopardy and entrepreneurship as many began to see the institution as the only game in town. Are there no huge costs associated with running the university in Osaka as a standalone enterprise, contrary to the dreams of the founding father? Have you realized that most successful people from Adada are those who live and pride their trade outside in Osaka? Has the university made Adada people more prosperous than they would have been otherwise? I don't have the answers, but the essence of scholarship is to question assumptions and to interrogate the so-called facts. Permit me to digress a little in order to illustrate the dialectics embedded in some of the questions I've raised above. After all, what we are discussing are social processes, and they are driven by a certain logic, ideology, and transformation, but very often with material contradictions and unfortunate realities that may not be obvious. In the late 1990s, I was a senior program specialist at the International Development Research Center of Canada, based in the regional office in Nairobi, Kenya. I had lived in Kenya since 1991, and had observed how tourism was touted by the government and other stakeholders as a major economic pillar of the economy, without anyone interrogating the cost of generating this international commodity or service. And I'm not referring to the direct costs. I engineered a multidisciplinary team of researchers based in one of their elite universities to holistically examine the tourism sector. The study looked at the opportunity costs, the environmental costs, the cultural pollution costs, the foreign payment costs, the different ways 
in which the mostly foreign-owned hotels and private lodges disadvantage the workers and the community, including the agency problem associated with overseas tourism agents collecting all the fees and lodging costs from travelers that left them with no money for incidental expenses while in Kenya, among other issues. A documentary was produced in the course of this exercise to give visual effects to some of these costs. When the benefits were placed against the costs, it got the government thinking of new ways to reduce these costs. This was an expensive project, but it was worth it. This was an exercise in local parlance called shaking the table. But it took me, a non-Kenyan, with the support of Canadian Fund, to open the eyes of Kenyans to these untoward possibilities. And for the first time, question their perceived reality and beliefs with respect to this sector. I took immense pride in the outcome of this project, and so did my organization. The point I'm making, if you look at the pillar tourism in Kenya, you look at UNN in Nosoka, you begin to understand that benefits are costs, and some of these costs are immense. Now I return to the University of Nigeria. The value the sighting of a university brings to a community is beyond the admission and processing of students for graduation, with almost 100% of the graduates leaving town after graduation. Neither is it measured by the limited employment it may provide to some members of the community within the university itself, nor in the limited impact on the service and trading sector of our local economy. A land-grant university, like the University of Nigeria, is designed to be a center of solutions, with key manufacturing firms co-locating to take advantage of the intellectual capital of the university. East School of Engineering, School of Pharmacy, and Faculty of Veterinary Medicine would have given birth attracted beneficial private sector to set up factories in Osaka. And the Faculty of Agriculture would have used their knowledge and extension services to improve the yield of Osaka farmers and the catchment area, hence their income and prosperity. But none of this has happened. Our story is a depressing tale of missed opportunities with research output from brilliant scholars carefully filed in their dusty shelves. It seems that the longer we waited, the more difficult it has become to dismantle the fossilized framework and mindset that has made innovation unrealizable. And there is enough blame to go around all the stakeholders, including all of us. What is worrisome is that even when we lament the existing situation, there is no concerted effort to study and understand the underlying forces causing this lack of change. Shouldn't our attention be more pointedly directed at this? According to Douglas North, a Nobel Prize winner in economics, he said, and I quote, the key to understanding the process of change is the intentionality of the players enacting institutional change and the comprehension of the issues. So you have to have intention, you have to understand the issues. What some have called having the knowledge of the means. Throughout history and the present world, economic growth and social development has been episodic because either the player's intentions have not been societal well-being or the player's comprehension of the issues have been so imperfect that the consequences have deviated radically from intention. And I'm pleased that uh, the mayor elects are all here and they are listening. Your intention must match that knowledge of the means, the manner in which this society needs to be transformed. So what has been the intention of our research? To publish and get promoted and become a professor or to transform society. The intention of the issue is extremely important because it informs both the content of our research 
and the extra diligence required in its translation to innovation. Why is what we are doing today so tied to what we did in the past? And what are the sources of this path dependence? And can they be dismantled when we constantly reproduce, with few exceptions, visionless and unpurposeful leadership of the university without any sense of mission of the university? How many people trying to govern this university has come to understand the mission that Zeke was stating earlier? The hope that this is like Batu Okolo and a few others created, has since dashed. Can private external agents of change alter the perception that will help create a new super environment and a school of thought? Can the Adada Educational Foundation engage the university and act as this change agent? This is where I am bringing the Adada Foundation as partners in trying to redirect the university. As I was writing this lecture, I engaged my son, Ikeme, in a conversation, by the way, those of you who listened to my inaugural know that he was saying the same Ikeme who gave me the title of my inaugural, Why Are They So Poor? So whenever I want to engage in any intellectual work, I call him. So as I was writing there, I engaged my son in a conversation about universities and their economic impact in their catchment area. He started with his own example. He spent five years at Purdue University's highly ranked School of Engineering and spent another seven years after graduation working in a remote suburb of Purdue University doing engineering work in a car manufacturing services company. Finished, didn't leave the environment. This was the same company that offered him summer internship from his first year till he graduated. That company and many others co-located in Kokomo, West Lafayette, where Purdue is located, Indianapolis, and other nearby cities because of the intellectual capital from the engineering and other technology-related faculties of Purdue University. He mentioned the existence of a Purdue Research Park located three kilometers north of Purdue University. It is the largest university-affiliated research park in the United States developed by the Purdue Research Foundation. It is home to about 200 companies with business incubation program, which facilitates the commercialization of innovation technologies with a large cluster of technology-based companies in Indiana, simply because of Purdue University. This park, according to Wikipedia, has a financial impact equivalent to 1.3 billion per annum on the state of Indiana, and has created 4,000 high quality jobs. There is also the Purdue Manufacturing Extension Partnership, which is a public-private partnership institution that provides services to the manufacturing hub in Indiana, and has huge economic impact, estimated at about United States dollar, 790 million in 2023. It has support from both the federal state government and the private sector. To bring this to be, Purdue University trustees have always placed leadership ability, managerial skills, prior experience of achievements, entrepreneurial skill, fundraising ability, interconnectedness to the political and commercial class as foremost requirement for recruiting their university presidents. It is not that you publish 200 papers that should make you a vice chancellor. This is a leadership position. This is a, not necessarily uh, a purely academic position. Purdue University is a land-grant public university with origin and mission similar to that of the University of Nigeria and Soka. In his address at the Michigan State University on July 10, 1959, I go back to Namde Azikiwe again. Dr. Namde Azikiwe confirmed that the proposed University of Nigeria would draw inspiration and would be based on the philosophy of land-grant institutions, such as Hampton and Tuskegee Institutes and Morrill Act of 1862. Note that one of the concrete steps taken, taken towards setting up the university was the compulsory 
acquisition, this university, by the Ministry of Town Planning, of 1,000 acres of land for the university and 10,000 acres of land in Nonsoka Division for the purpose of agricultural and commercial estates of the university. Jerry Uguain, where is the 10,000 acres of land for the enterprise? I'm not going to here. Zeke said 1,000 for the university, 10,000 for the estates, realizing university will be behaving like Purdue University. Could this be the 10,000 acres? I didn't say this, he said it. So, he said that the university source of income will, in addition to the regular practice in the United Kingdom, include earnings from its agricultural and commercial estates. That, a better 10,000, the commercial estates will be based there. The university will, through her agricultural faculty, feed itself and sell the surplus to society that, that, that will have benefited. Ikeme also directed my attention to the paper by Janet Weisenberger of Ohio State University on selecting the appropriate measures of economic impact to tell the university's story. She stated that the mission of public and land grant universities, such as UNN, and to a substantial degree, private universities, has changed in recent decades to include a charge to enhance the regional economy of the states in which these institutions are located. The shift in mission has prompted universities to employ a variety of measures of economic impact in an attempt to measure and communicate their importance to a region's economy. When we finished our conversation, he sent me some research materials and a tweet from one Ugo Chuku Arono, and I quote that tweet. Ugo Chuku said, I am currently taking a tour at the Temporary University of Technology in Finland. And it is amazing how startups and big tech companies, big tech companies like Huawei, have offices within the university premises. Big tech companies. Faculty of Engineering, University of Nigeria is one of the first, one of the best. I don't know the status now. When I travel and we speak in international fora, I always ask, is there one world-class engineering school in Africa? One. I met with government the other day, and I was saying, if you bring Chinese people to do your railway, if they leave, can you reproduce the railway? That's why they said, this thing is intentional, is purposeful. You have to understand it. When China was trying to build a speed train, they ran into difficulty. They didn't have the technology. They tried and tried. They couldn't make it. Then they said, okay, France has it, Japan has it, Germany has it. They decided on France. They went to France and said, we need 60 trains. But guess what? Six of these 60, you will bring fully manufactured into China. 20 or so, you are going to bring in parts and assemble in China. The balance, you will come to China and start from scrap to manufacture it. By the time they have gone through this process, my brothers and sisters, of course they've gotten the technology. They don't need France again. They can now come to Nigeria and say, we can build your speed train. But our people will travel abroad and say, bring the city, bring all the workers, come and construct. And I always ask, there is a difference between made in Africa, made in Nigeria, and made by Africans, and made by Nigerians. 
for as long as you cannot command these production processes, you are not transforming. The economy is not going anywhere. This is the vision of those who want to develop. So this young man was talking about Finland. He says, the professors and lecturers here are part of the co-founders of some of the startups. And with this, you can see direct impact of research in the environment. I have closely studied the Finnish engineering, and I'm super impressed with what they are doing. And it is clear that they are making huge progress because of the relationship between academia and the industry. And since I'm on Finland, because I teach also Finland to my students, the Finnish Academy, let's see whether we learn some lessons from there. The Finnish Academy industry linkage in Finland is exemplary. This is a story of how an intelligent government uses its universities to innovate, transform, and create shared prosperity for the citizens. Rather than stand aloof, the government brokers this important relationship, creating and using appropriate accountable institutions to do so. Finland was basically agroforestry product. You know, it was at one time even colonized by Russia. You know, they were struggling. There was famine. There was no food. It is, it used to be, and I think it may still be, the number one producer of paper in the world. In fact, let me tell you a short story on this one. When I was running the African Technology Policy Studies Network in Nairobi, I wrote to the Finnish ambassador in Kenya and uh, wanted uh, uh, Finland to give the institution some money. So he invited me for lunch. When I got there, he took me out. We went to lunch. He said, can I tell you something? He was looking around to make sure nobody is hearing him. He said, the trees from where we get the paper, from where we produce the paper, and we are number one, we have to nurture it in Finland. But that these trees are growing in the wild in Zambia. Did you hear me? They, they are nurturing their own for it to grow. These ones are already growing, but our people are not producing paper. That's why he was looking around to make sure you know, an ambassador is not supposed to reveal this. But it is the telltale of the African uh, story. Even though it was originally agroforestry, today, technology export is over 50% of all our exports, Finland. About 27% of Finnish workers are employed directly or indirectly from technology companies. The Finnish Funding Agency for Innovation, called TECAS, a part of the Finnish Ministry of Employment and Economy, is the main institution used to broker this research industry linkage. It finances research, development and innovation, and supports innovation in service and industrial sectors. It further assists Finnish companies to gain access to the international market. The story of Nokia, if you remember the Nokia phone, the giant telephone manufacturer illustrates this point. The Nokia company was originally a paper manufacturer, moving, moved gradually into electricity generation, and rubber works used to make uh, rain boots, manufacturing rain boots and tire. It graduated into robotics, chemicals, and telecommunications in the 1970s. By the 1990s, TECES, the Finnish funding agency for innovation, was financing 26% of companies' projects. And Nokia gave back to Finland with huge tax revenue and high demand for highly skilled workers. This demand for workers propelled the change in their educational system. And the Finnish schools are now ranked the best in the world. The Finnish Minister of Education Affairs and Foreign Trade, Alexander Stop, said, our success story of the last 25 years has been pretty defined by Nokia. We used to be a top 30 country in the world, out of 200. Now when you look at international standards and measures of education, 
competitiveness, GDP per capita, we are top three. We became a very affluent nation with the rise of Nokia. The power of one product. The power of research, of universities linking to industry, of this industry also influencing the curriculum of the university. Nokia gave pride and confidence to the Finnish people that gave rise for other companies to be born. As Nokia was declining, Tekes increased its funding for new and innovative businesses and launched a startup accelerator in 2009. Success has followed them since with rise in venture capital that is also transforming the lives of the youth with over 30% of the 19,000 students at Helsinki's Auto University as members of the Entrepreneurship Society. I now return again to Nsuka. This short finished story illustrates the power of one product. More importantly, it demonstrates how a combination of a purposeful public and private sector can grow an economy, create wealth and shared prosperity, build confidence, and be a stimulus for educational and curriculum change in a university. Nsoka needs a research park, serving as a business incubation park that can attract both public and private resources, and serving as a training ground for a new generation of science and engineering graduates ready for the fourth industrial revolution. The Adad Educational Foundation can champion this, working the, with the envisaged new leadership of the University of Nigeria. And the proposed vehicle assembly of uh, Chifonu, I hope he's listening, the ingress, being planned already in operation in Enugu, should relocate to that car park. Didn't you hear what I said? He's planning already, trying to produce Nenugu. I'm saying today, we are making a declaration, seconded by all, that he will relocate the plant to this new park, Nansoka. It makes sense, doesn't it? The intellectual capital of the engineering faculty of the university should be used to support the park and assembly plants. We should have an ambition for made in Isuka vehicles with parts produced within the park. After all, innocent vehicles are produced in Newe. They are over there. The people are lazy about clapping. Clap if you want to clap. In, is, is this not what Zeke envisaged? when he asked for 10,000 acres of land for commercial estates for university. That's what he was thinking about. What has happened to the 10 acres? Imara Jerry has refused to answer me. A combined reading of Zeke's earlier statement on students working to pay their school fees as internship and the need for a commercial estate for the university suggests that he has a research manufacturing park in Osaka in mind. And the research park serving as a workshop for practical engineering training and acquisition of product management skills. These are the new things, new skills that are selling globally. Entrepreneurship, just like service, is vocational and will be better acquired by practice. Has anyone taken time to evaluate what the impact the entrepreneurial centers and studies have had on the entrepreneurial landscape of Nigeria? or how many graduates of this program have been able to set up shops anywhere. Their usefulness is doubtful at best. Compare this with the success of the Igbo apprenticeship system, the Igbo boy. If you give graduates of an entrepreneurship program from the university and graduates of Igbo boy the same startup fund and they evaluate their performance in five years, the difference will be clear. The other one went to classroom to learn it. The other one learned by practice. Confirming that Igba Boy is a valid training workshop in its own right, 
with associated learned values and discipline, and that entrepreneurship is a practiced vocation. Let's look at how can this be. Now is the time to begin to trans the transformation of the university into what the founding fathers envisaged. Other people will be the major beneficiaries, reinforcing their innate intelligence, building their confidence, sense of pride, and creating prosperity. Tabugo. But it will require a disruptive mindset, one that allows us to give true meaning to the mission of this university, leads us to create new administrative and teaching culture that inculcates new values to her graduates. And there has to be a certain intentionality about this. There is a huge cost in maintaining the current order, but there is even a greater additional cost, social cost if the institutional change does not occur soon. The decline is all around us in this great institution. We can't even keep the environment clean. We have no light when our engineering faculty can be empowered to generate our own light. This university has no light for almost one month now. In a non-egotic world where changes are happening so rapidly, current realities are not predictable from past events, and uncertainty is the new norm. Institutions must diversify their modes of instruction, enlarge the choices before their students and faculty, stimulate their curiosity and creativity as a matter of relevance and survivability. As the world continues to evolve, due to increased stock of knowledge, creating complex societal interactions and problems, what have we done? We have remained the same and becoming obsolete basking in the past roar and the glory of one's agile liar. Let me take that one again. I said we have remained the same and becoming obsolete, basking in the past roar and glory of one's agile liar. I went into a PhD class recently to teach. Almost all the students were graduates of this university. I was alarmed, but the student did not appreciate my concern. Very few students from outside this university are demanding our postgraduate education. It's an important indicator as to where this university stands. We have not created new services that descending customers want. We have limited the possibilities of this university because we have recent leadership that was always looking at the area view mirror. In the recent past, the leadership of the university has been visionless and incoherent, and it has been building up from one regime to another, taking university down the path of mediocrity, deepening the division in the university along micro-primordial affiliations with everyone clamoring for turn by turn, irrespective of competence and capacity. People assume the office of the vice chancellor without plan, philosophy, or vision for how to recreate the university. They have a mindset of maintaining the status quo at best, and so have brought the bar lower than they met it. Still, we fold our hands and allow the university to continue to wither. We don't need anyone's permission to think about the future. As far as I'm concerned, silence is no longer golden. In silence, we have all become complicit. We need a disruptive leader as the vice chancellor of this university, one who has the confidence to dream big, plan big, and achieve big, one who is willing to disrupt the existing culture, commit to certain ideals as envisaged by Dr. Nam Azikiwe, and is willing to enlarge the tribe. It is not always about money. It is about ideas. It's not going to be easy, but it is doable. Charlene Lee, the author of a best-selling book, Disruptive Mindset, said, disruptive transformation is so difficult because it offsets the status quo and shifts power relationships. It requires not settling for the table that has been set for us, and instead committing to run towards a future that is radically different from and better than where we are today. You have to begin with the end in mind. The co-founder of InfoSystem with a market capitalization of 96.3 million US dollars 
Narayana Muti said, growth is painful, change is painful, but nothing is as painful as staying stuck where you do not belong. The universe of Nigeria with the assemblage of fine minds deserves to recalibrate a new narrative that will restore its fading glory. To achieve this, we need to resist the excessive intrusion of the National University Commission as they attempt to appropriate the role of the Senate. I was in Senate yesterday, and the discussion was they are so called, I don't know, CMAS or something they are calling it, trying to commonalize curriculum. When you get a BSc in Nigeria, it is a BSc in Nigeria. It's different from a BSc anywhere else. It's every university has its own unique curriculum and teaching. That's why the degree is BSc in Nigeria, because of BSc Sokoto, BSc Medugri, BSc Ibado, and so on and so forth. We have given in too much to NUC, and I said NUC must now stop. They must go beyond words and must build a coalition for change using those who have the knowledge or the means to address this challenge. In the repositioning, oh, by the way, I even said that Degrees vary according to university awarding it. This university must reject any attempt by NUC to communize the curriculum of all universities, even if it means taking NUC to court. In the repositioning endeavor, the Adade Educational Foundation can become the new catalyst and an important partner. The address by the new chairman of the governing council to the university community suggests that the council have come to do work. They must go beyond words and must build a coalition for change using those who have the knowledge or the means to address the challenges. In order to actualize the lofty goals of that address, the governing council must recruit a vice chancellor that can create a movement for change and who understands the urgency of now. Their task starts today, but the task is for all of us, including Adada Foundation. Thank you very much, and God bless. Please, let's give him a standing ovation. Brilliant, disruptive, challenging the status quo. Let's put our hands together one more time for Professor Osita Ogu. We either stay where we are, or take the bull by the horn and make progress. If you had something, put your hands together one more time for that brilliant address. And I can tell you for free that what he has said today will be referred to decades from right, I mean from now.